Welcome back to another episode of the Fearless Society podcast. We're continuing our series on spiritual disciplines. Tonight, we're going to be talking about evangelism. Let's get into it. You're listening to the Fearless Society podcast, and we're building a community of fearless Christians who boldly live out the call that God has placed in our lives. We aren't afraid to talk about who we are and what we believe. Following Jesus today isn't easy, but it is worth it. And our goal is to come alongside you as we encourage and equip each other to live boldly and fearlessly because a fearless church begins with us. Together, we are the Fearless Society. All right, so as we get into this, do you have any, like, evangelism horror stories we'll call it i have one i think i i think i've shared this before on the podcast but um we in college we would go on a mission trip every year and the the one year i actually went um we went to peru and um as part of it we had to do this street evangelism like walking up to random people and sharing the gospel with them and we had done preparation we had done different stuff like And every one of us had to take turns. But I've never been comfortable with this type of evangelism. And it's always made me really anxious um, just talking to people that I don't know. And so it came to my turn. My team kind of like pushed me to the front. And they were so sweet. They were trying to help me. But I'm listening to like all their voices. Ask this, say this, do this, be like this. And so what I pulled out from my team And what I said to this woman was, you're going to hell. Don't you agree? And like when I said the second half of it, like the translator like looked at me like, what? (laughs) But still (laughs) translated it. And Uh, like, oh, my gosh. The translation buffer didn't save you. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure he just judged me and was like, you got to sink or swim, baby. But <laughs> yeah, no, um, uh, God, I, I still think about that woman and I pray for her. I pray that she encountered somebody who could undo the horror that I had just <laughs> put her through of being this like young white kid in Peru walking up to this woman and telling her she's going to hell and then asking her if she agreed. And I, I, I'm telling you, like, I, to this day, when I hear the word evangelism or I think of evangelism, like my palms get sweaty, my heart starts racing. And I'm like, I no, nope. I it's, it's good. I can't do this. Like, I don't think I'm called to this. (laughs) It's bad. Yeah. What's 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 your uh, evangelism horror story, I guess? So I I went to this um, I went to this evangelism training like seminar. It was like a one day like and they this church brought in these people to like help teach people how to do evangelism. And then and then in the afternoon, we like went out to do evangelism. Now, I had done. Um, I had done some door to door evangelism. You were in... on that missions trip and <clears throat> that I was on and you did fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> but I had done some, you know, a fair amount of door to door evangelism actually in like Central and South America. Um, but also some like street evangelism here in the States and different things like that. So I was fairly familiar with it. We had done some. Um, and I had d- gone through a couple of the different, uh, you know, like sharing Jesus without fear and some of the other like different evangelism resources that are out there, you know, from youth group age on. I'd been through a few of them. Um, but anyway, I went I went to this this training thing and it was and I think we're going to get into this a little bit later, but it was it was evangelism totally devoid of discipleship. Mm. And which is already just um, happens a lot. Yeah, it's already just not not where I'm at with evangelism. Um, but anyway, I, I kind of expected that and and was just kind of there along for the ride. But then we get out and we're like doing evangelism outreach and stuff. And I was with 
uh, they sent out like split us up into a couple groups and like each group had one of the one person from the team that they brought in um and this this woman that i was with was just like unbelievably like aggressive evangelism like the Jehovah's Witnesses get a bad rap. They were like super tame, you know. Like, <laughs> when you wish it was the Jehovah's Witnesses that knocked on your door, yeah. there's something wrong. Uh, oh man, <laughs> man, and and so I I just recently learned this thing about like the um the stages of change, and um and how there's like these different stages that we go through when when we make some sort of life change. And, you know, pre-contemplation, like you don't even realize that there's something wrong that you want to change. And, and then you get into this contemplation stage where you start thinking about it. You start recognizing something that you might want to do different or to be different in your life. And, and then you start, um, I forget all the terms, but the next stage, you start kind of weighing the pros and cons and, and what are the practical out, like effects of this going to be? What is my, what are my friends going to think? What is my family going to think? Um, you know, is this going to have any implications on my job or, or different things like that? Um, you know, and then, and then you actually start taking action and so on and so forth. And this was like, and, and this, like it, oftentimes it takes months, sometimes even longer to go through all of these different stages. And mm -hmm. this was like, let's try and get people through all of these stages in like five minutes, you know? And it was just, and I remember this one young guy particularly just came walking down the street and this woman was just like talking with him and the conversation started off pretty good and um you know and he he has aspirations of becoming like a, a uh a recording artist and um and so i just started asking him questions about like his music and and different things like that and just trying to like build a little bit of a relationship and she was like no that's like we gotta get this done you know and uh and so <laughs> And she just like, she would not let him go without saying that he would accept Christ. And he just wanted to leave. And so he was like, he got to the point where I was like, okay, I know what she wants me to say. And so I'm going to say it so I can get out of here. And, and I remember like coming back, like we gathered back at the church afterwards and they're like, oh yeah, we had this many people make decisions for the Lord. And I'm like, I don't think we did. I don't think we did. You know, um, I don't think that somebody saying what you want them to say so that they can get away from you it's <laughs> counts as bringing someone to Jesus, you know, and um, it's kind of like this, like, crusades view of evangelism, almost like we're going to go in, we're going to tell them what they need to do. They're going to do it. We're going to change their culture. We're going to leave, <clears throat> you know? Yeah. And, and we do see in scripture, we see in scripture sometimes where the message of the gospel came into people that had never heard it before and God just moved in their life and they immediately dropped everything and followed Jesus. And so God can work. God can work through those six stages of change quickly in a, quickly, in a few minutes. Um, but that's not the norm. You know, mm -hmm. that those are miraculous things that God does sometimes. And, and we need to, you know, I, even you look at the book of Acts, and it's just like miracle after miracle after miracle. But we can sit down and read it in a short amount of time. That was years and years of time that those events took place over. And between all of those miracles was just the day in and day out of living life as a follower of Jesus and, and bringing that message to the world and not miraculous things happening. Mm. But God's still working nonetheless. Yeah, you know, we... we um. We had a pastor one time and he, he kind of talked about uh, this old marketing principle in terms of the gospel and this, I forget what it's called, like the rule of seven or something like that, where it's, it takes someone at least seven times hearing something to make a decision on whether they want to buy it or not, you know, and, and he kind of applied that to the gospel of like, you know, sometimes it takes people seven different times or more of hearing the gospel before somebody's ready to make a decision. And you might reach that person on the first time. You might be that first first time through the gospel. You might be the seventh time through the gospel. But like we have to give people the time to make that decision for themselves. And um, I really valued that view and I really love that view and kind of I've embraced that view a lot more of like everyone's on this journey. Everyone's in this process. I, I listened to this other, um, I was a Bible study. We listened to this um, 
recording and I, I wish I remembered what it was because I'd love to go back and re-listen to it. Um, but this guy was, again, talking about how so often like everyone is on the spectrum, right? Like the alphabet, like you start at A, you end at Z. And we are all somewhere along this spectrum. And when it comes to evangelism, so often we assume that everyone we come in contact with is starting at L, you know, but in reality, some of those people might be at A or B. And so we have to be able to um, meet them where they're at and and walk with them to that next step. Yeah. And in fairness to, you know, in fairness to people that people that love aggressive evangelism, I, I often think their hearts are in the right place, right? They see people's need for Jesus and they know what Jesus has done for them and they know what Jesus can do for people. And they want, they want people to, to find that freedom. Um, and God has moved through them too. Right. And, and you don't know, you don't know, like, I mean, people use this as a evang like a leveraging tactic in evangelism, which I don't think is great, but it's, it's true that we don't know when our life is going to end, you know? Um, and, and the people you're talking to, you don't know how much longer they have on this earth. And so if you really care about them, why wouldn't you want to be aggressive, you know? Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, if you're so aggressive that you're pushing them away, that you're not caring about them. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and certainly if you start to make it about a numbers game of like, oh, how many people can I bring to Jesus? Now, now you're really in dangerous territory. This isn't a contest. <laughs> but I also think like, and and that's, and maybe we can talk about this, this point. Um, but we often look at evangelism as how many people can I bring to Jesus? Like how many yeses can I get? How many sinners prayers can I hear prayed? Um, but it's not necessarily us doing the work. Like evangelism is this beautiful thing that we get to partner with God doing. It's not we doing, it's like, it's not us doing it. It's, it's us partnering with God to share his message and partnering with the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one who unblinds eyes. The Holy Spirit is the one who's preparing the way. We're just faithful in obedience and following through. And so, um, you know, evangelism is not something that we just do, um, but it's something we get to partner with God doing. And in fact, evangelism is probably the greatest form of spiritual warfare there is, right? You're literally pushing back the kingdom of darkness. Like Isaiah prophesies about the Messiah. Um, and he says, you know, uh, the spirit of God has anointed me to, um, I forgot what they're like, but like open the prison doors, let loose the, the prison, like the, those bound up in chains, open the eyes of the blind. Like, that is, it's it's prophesied about Jesus, and yet we get to partake in this ministry of Christ. When Christ left his disciples, he said, you will do greater things than these. You know, I have to leave so you can do greater things than these, but I will be with you and I will send another, a comforter to be with you and to lead you and to guide you into all of these things. And so we partner with Christ and we bring freedom to the oppressed. We bring uh, chain breaking to those who are enslaved by the bondage of sin. We we bring light to the darkness. We participate in this act of 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 casting out the darkness and pushing back the darkness and bringing light and hope into the world. Yeah. And that I, I believe that there's nothing Satan wants more than to keep us from doing evangelism, doing the work of evangelism and bringing the message of the gospel to people. And it's, it's why I, I think that is why so many of our churches have become like glorified country clubs where we just are comfortable to sit and receive, you know, it's like, oh, I go to church and I get fed and I go to church and, and, and we're not our, you know, and this is, this is a, as much a condemnation on me as anyone. Um, so I'm not, I'm not here to point fingers or anything like that, but we just go to be comfortable and to be fed and to, to be poured into and, and we're not going and doing the thing that Jesus called us to do. Yeah. You know? 
Well, I mean, I, I remember like I've sat in a church service and um, and I've talked to to Christians who are like, well, we we're really praying that God brings us an evangelist. And they're like, we need an evangelist in our church. And I remember asking them, like, what is what is that going to do? Like, what is an evangelist going to do? Like, if we look at Ephesians 4, 11, like to the church are given um, pastors, teachers, uh, evangelists, apostles and prophets, like to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Right. Like Jesus didn't give just give the Great Commission to evangelists. And so I remember asking, like, well, even if you have an evangelist, how are you going to go? How are you going to participate in evangelism? Like, you don't have to be going door to door. You don't have to stand on a soapbox on the preach corner. Uh, on the preach corner, <laughs> mm-hmm. you don't have to stand a soapbox and preach on the corner of a street. Like, but we're all called to a form of evangelism within our lives, and yet so often we find ourselves in looking at scripture and looking at the church and looking at history and going, man, there were so many of these great evangelists. We just need another Billy Graham. We just need another, um, I'm blanking on some of the other names, but fill in the blank here and then we'll be set. Well, why? Because it it means you can take a step back from your God-given responsibility to practice the spiritual discipline of evangelism. And I get it. Like, again, the word evangelism fills me with so much fear and trembling. But at the same time, like, I also have a huge heart for evangelism. I have a heart for seeing people reached with the gospel because it's not about numbers. It's not about words that you can pray. It's not about checking off a box and completing a a, a step along your journey. Like I believe as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, there is hope of a future. There is a glorious future that awaits each and every one of us in Christ. And because I have this hope, right? Like my sins have been washed clean. I have been forgiven. Like I'm not who I am. I'm a new creation. We can talk about our identity in Christ. But because because of all of that, I have a hope of this glorious eternity where I can dwell in the presence of God forever and ever and ever with no sickness and no pain and no, no, um, you know, no wars, no crying, no nothing like that. I want that for more people because I look around and I see a world that's that's suffering and I see a world that's dying and I see a world that is in so much torment. As a believer, I go, but there's hope. And I think that's the heart behind evangelism. So like, let's not get stuck thinking evangelism is one specific thing. Like, let's open the door and say evangelism is is sharing that message, the gospel that leads us to hope of eternity. And and let's let's focus. That's that's what we mean by evangelism. And so we're not talking necessarily door to door. We're not talking standing on a preach. uh, I get it. Did it again. We're (laughs) not talking standing on a street corner preaching like evangelism. God's going to call you to evangelism. God's going to call you to evangelism within the context of who he created you to be and in the context of where you are, right? Because when Jesus called the disciples into the Great Commission, he said into Jerusalem, Judea, all of Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? There's this like, and it's the age old thing, like there's this start in your own neighborhood, start in your backyard. You don't have to sell everything and go to Africa, though if God tells you to do that, then then by all means do that. But like when God calls you to evangelism and when God tells you to share the gospel and when God tells you to speak about him, it's going to be in the context of who he created you to be and in the context of where he's placed you currently. Yeah. absolutely. I love today. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm like, I'll let you talk in a minute. <laughs> I love today. Like we have this testimony time at church and um, one of the testimonies um, someone was sharing just about how they had been praying that they might have the opportunity to talk about God with a friend of theirs. And I've heard so many people say this. Oh, well, I just prayed, Lord, if you want me to do this, then you'll make a way. But it's okay because this is impossible. And then like the door opens up 
and it is just right there in their face. Yeah. And so like I love um, Sam Rayner wrote a book all about uh, evangelism and he says evangelism starts in prayer. So many stories of people who've been petrified of evangelism and who've known they've been called to evangelism simply go, okay, God, I know you want me to talk to this person. So you just make an appointment, set it up and I'll be obedient and I'll do it. And God is faithful and he does set up those divine appointments and he opens the door for the call. Yeah. And like you said before, this is the work of God that we get to join in, right? And so if you're starting your evangelism and you're not starting it in prayer, you're you're in for a rough, you're in for a rough ride. <laughs> yeah. You can't lead people to you. You can't lead people to Jesus. Jesus mm. can lead people to Jesus through you. Yeah. Yeah. And so starting in prayer is so, so important. I actually have a a, a book on um it's more on like uh just reaching your community and, and being an an invite culture in your church, inviting people to church. But it's a 30 day book that you walk through in the first 15 days of prayer. Mm. Isn't that also just a praying. Sam Rayner book? Uh, Tom Rayner. Tom Rayner. Oh, yeah. Tom Rayner wrote, wrote the other evangelism book too. I said okay. Sam Rayner. I was Sorry. curious. <laughs> anyway, yeah. One of those Rayners. Yeah. yeah. They're both great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's, and it's really, you really do need to start in prayer. So, um, yeah. so what is the difference? between evangelism and discipleship? Yeah, I feel like this is a little bit of a trick question. Um, and, <laughs> and I'll preface this by saying, um, I have always felt like there was this distinction. Like we talked about evangelism in the Great Commission, and then there was this need for discipleship of people who were saved. And, and so I was like, well, I don't want to do evangelism. I want to do discipleship. Like, I don't want to lead people to Jesus. I want to help them grow deeper. And, and I think sometimes... Some of us are called more towards going and and bringing Jesus to people. And some of us are called more to strengthening the body of Christ, right? Like, let's just lay that out there. Um, but what I think gets mixed up in this like evangelism versus discipleship idea is that you can disciple people to Christ, right? Like you can walk, discipleship is walking with somebody and living life together and and working through life together right so you have say you have this friend and and they're just they're hurting and you're just like I just want to be a good friend I want to be supportive I want to be encouraging they know I'm a Christian I'm going to just come alongside them and just walk with them answer their questions and just be there and pray and and what happens is you can end up walking with that person from their time of need and just doing life together to the point where they are ready to accept Christ, right? And so I don't think, sometimes we go, well, evangelism brings people to Jesus and then discipleship picks it up from there. But what can happen is that discipleship, you can disciple somebody pre-salvation to salvation and then beyond. And I think, you know, it, it, in the past, we've had several different evangelism movements. We've had the track movement. We've had the street corner preachers movement. We've had, um, you know, the the healing ministry. We've had we've had several different like movements within evangelism that seek to reach the lost and bring them to Christ. And we've had several movements within discipleship that seek to set up this system of teachings almost like a catechism of sorts, to bring people deeper. But what is lacking in separating those two is the real community that Christ has called us to in living life together, which you can back a few episodes in this season. I think actually this was before the uh, ad break we took for Advent, but um, we talked about community and we talked about fellowship with believers. Discipleship often happens in fellowship. But so to say, what's the difference between evangelism and discipleship? I think they're so much more intertwined than we typically think. Or at least they should be. They I should think. be. You know, I think yeah. they do get, I think they do get separated when it, it is that kind of like evangelism is this like, um, you know, if you, 
if you give somebody a tract, you're doing evangelism. But if you just give somebody a tract, you're not doing discipleship. Right. And that, and that doesn't, I mean, lots of people have been saved through tract ministry and, you know, from some reports I've heard, it's still working very well in other places around the world. I think it's time has kind of waned here in our culture. Um, and, and by all means, whatever, whatever means we can use to, to bring people into the kingdom by all means, um, but I think so often when I think of evangelism, I think of the Great Commission. But you look at the Great Commission and what Jesus, the the commission that Jesus gave to his followers on earth before he left, and it's go and make disciples. Right? And so evangelism, if it's not deeply connected with discipleship, makes converts, not mm-hmm. disciples. Um, and And Jesus isn't looking for converts. He's not looking for fans. He's not looking for, you know, he's looking for disciples, people that will follow him, that will walk like he did, that will live like he did, that will be selfless like he was selfless. And, um, and that's something that doesn't come naturally and that we can't, we can read about it in a book, but we learn it as we see other people do it. And so, I learn how to be a, a better disciple of Jesus as I watch my mentors and my peers follow Jesus and walk like Jesus. And and then emulate that. Right? Yeah. And and just like Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. And and I believe that we should all strive to be able to say that of like follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not going to get it perfect all the time. I'm not going to, you know, we're all going to mess up at times. Um, but even in our response to how we mess up, you know, do we own up to it? Do we confess it? Do we walk in the light? Do we, you know, and and so that is, that's what Jesus has called us to. And that evangelism, that that moment of people coming to Jesus and confessing Jesus is just a small piece of the broader picture of discipleship and what God has called us to. One of the things that you just said that made me think about this is um, this idea of watching other people follow Christ and then emulating that. And I, and I think I think sometimes discipleship's a little bit more than that. Like there is iron sharpens iron, right? It's in the Proverbs. Um, but one of the things that, that kind of reminded me of is this verse, 1 Peter 3.15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Like, so people are seeing something in the way that you live your life, right? They're watching you and they go, wait a minute, that person has hope and it doesn't make sense. Like Peter's writing to a church that's like dispersed and in persecution. Hope does not make sense. And yet he says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. And this this, this verse is kind of where we get the idea of apologetics from, um, the defense of the Christian faith. And yet it's this verse. And if you look at the rest of it, you see it's all about what love looks like and what loving other people look like and how to love well. And then because you're loving well, people are going to realize there's something different about you and ask you why you have hope, how you're so loving. Then you're prepared to give an answer. You know, and so this idea of discipleship is watching people follow Christ and then emulating them or walking with them. I think it naturally leads to evangelism, right? Like if you are a disciple of Christ, it means you're walking different than anyone else in the whole world, right? Like you yeah. have hope. Like we're, we're living in a world right now that is desperate for hope. Like our culture is looking for hope in so many different areas right now. And yet as believers, are we living according to the hope that we have? Are we walking out that hope in relationship with other people? And that will naturally lead to opportunities for evangelism because we are not living in fear like the world. We are not living um, with this heaviness and this burden of life we are living under the freedom and the grace and the love of God that brings us hope, 
right? And so part of evangelism is simply walking out your faith and pursuing Christ. And as you do that, as you become more like Christ, I mean, goodness gracious, like look at the ministry of Christ. As we become more like Christ, more loving, more hope-filled, more longing for his presence, as we are filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? Like it overflows within us to the world around us that, that we, we, there's a tangible difference in who we are. And so in walking out discipleship, it naturally should lead to evangelism. Absolutely. It reminds me, I, um, there's this person that I, that I used to work with and, uh, and you know, we were spent quite a bit of time together just on the job, just working. And, um, and I was never like, I was, I was never afraid to, I was never afraid to talk about my faith. Um, but I never, I was, um, I honestly, sometimes I look back on that season of my life and kind of kick myself like, man, I had, I, I should have been more intentional about talking about my faith. Um, but anyway, just a few weeks ago, uh, this person reached out to me and they were like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm, um, starting to read the Bible and interested in, in like faith and what this looks like. Um, would, would you have a few minutes to talk sometime? And I was like shocked. Like this is like, the, uh, you know, nothing against this person, but not the kind of person that I would have expected that from. And so anyway, we ended up having a phone conversation and, and, you know, they just said, you know, I've tried all these different things to find fulfillment in life and it all just seems empty. And I don't know what else to like, I don't know what else to try other than like finding meaning in, in something spiritual. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I don't think they're there of like, oh yeah, all gung ho for Jesus, but they're, they've recognized a need for something in their life that this world can't fulfill. Mm -hmm. Um, and they reached out because they knew, they knew that I genuinely loved and followed Jesus and found fulfillment in that in my life. Um, and so Sometimes, and and I'm not saying this to, again, like I said, I look back on that season of my life and think sometimes maybe I should have been more intentional and maybe I should have been. But sometimes our making disciples and our evangelism doesn't look like some perfect program. Sometimes it just looks like us being in love with Jesus and finding fulfillment in Jesus. And it's going to show to the world around us and it's going to provide opportunities and then I think where we need to be intentional is about taking those opportunities, you know, yeah. um, and it, they may come in the most unlikely places at the most unlikely times. But part a a big piece of doing evangelism is just being in love with Jesus yourself um, and letting letting your words about loving Jesus stem from a life of loving Jesus. I think, you know, sometimes in this in this country, we have so much freedom. We have the First Amendment, the the right to um free speech, you know, and and I think sometimes that we equate evangelism with this brazen or this outgoing um speech. And, and it can be. Absolutely. And so like, if that's what God's called you to, like, we're not saying that that's not evangelism. Um, we just want to provide a well-rounded view of evangelism in that, like, again, God calls you to evangelism, to practice evangelism in the context of who he made you and where he's placed you, right? Like we practice evangelism a lot different than um, believers in countries that are closed to the gospel, you know, like they, yeah. they are not going to be standing on the street corner preaching, um, unless, you know, God clearly calls them to that, like part the heavens and, you know, but like, um, 
our context for sharing might be different. And, and I think sometimes you living a life that is faithful to Christ that looks different than those around you. Like if you're at work and all your coworkers are like grumbling and complaining all the time, or if all of your coworkers are so anxious and and worried about um, the economy or, or, you know, the world today, um, there's a lot to worry about. Like, but you have this peace and this unwavering hope, or you have this joy that that doesn't make sense to your coworkers. Like, do you think they're just going to ignore that? Like, they're going to ask you about that, you know? And so I don't think we need to beat ourselves up because we're not good at street evangelism. Some people are. Some people are gifted in that. Um, But we need to be faithful to the context that God has called us in, that God has created us to be, you know, and just be faithful. And the longer we spend in his presence, the more we pursue him, the more we overflow with his presence and the more we look like him to the world around us. Yeah. And there's a cultural aspect too, right? If we, we live in a skeptical culture, especially yeah. when it comes to things of faith and spirituality. You know, our, our culture loves science and reason and facts and um, you know, and, and all that sort of thing. And faith, faith is not faith. If it's, you know, I think there's, I think there's lots of evidence for God. I think there's lots of evidence for the authenticity of scripture. I think there's lots of evidence for God, but at the end of the day, it's called faith for a reason. Mm. And, and we live in a culture that's skeptical of those kinds of things. and. And so it it takes more to convince someone. And honestly, it takes that, it takes oftentimes them seeing it in somebody else's life, seeing it really play out, seeing it with their own eyes and saying, okay, this is real. Yeah. This is not just wishful thinking. This is not just, um, you know, somebody using religion as a crutch. This is not just uh, feel goodism this is real and I've seen it yeah. with my own eyes in this person's life. And, um, and so I think in some cultures, evangelism can happen more quickly in our culture. Again, God can work miracles. Absolutely. And he does, but most of the time evangelism is a long game in our culture. Yeah. And that's why that's another reason why the discipleship aspect of it is so important. It's important everywhere, but it's especially important. I think in our culture, where it's often a long game. Yeah. And if you play that long game, what you're doing is you're building trust, right? And you're building relationships, you're building fellowship because, and and here's the other thing, like I would love to like have all the answers and not have any questions. Like, and I would love to give people all the answers and they don't have any questions. Like, but we can't bludgeon the death, the doubt out of people, right? Like, in order to have faith, you have to have some amount of doubt. Like, if you knew perfectly, it wouldn't be faith. It would just be knowledge, right? And so we want people to come to faith, right? And we don't have to have all the answers. They don't have to have all the answers. But as we play this this long game and as we disciple people to Christ, as we live out who God called us to be, live out this hope that we have in Christ, we're building trust with people so that they can come to us with their doubts. They can come to us with their questions. They can come to us with their worry and know that they're not going to be judged. You know, because again, they've seen the authenticity of our faith, right? We're not bludgeoning doubt away. We are living this life pursuing Christ and just living out our faith, our hope in him. Absolutely. Yeah. Any last thoughts? I don't think I have any. Of course, there's lots more that could be said. (laughs) We can talk about this for like, ages and ages. I think just to wrap up, I think just the last, the last point we have on there, you know, is that 
I, we, we've talked kind of broad picture evangelism. We didn't give any specifics of like how to practice this because we're all individuals. God's called us to practice it differently. But seek God in prayer. Um, ask him to set up opportunities for you to share with people. Ask him who he wants you to share the gospel with and ask him to provide opportunities for that. And he's faithful to do that. Um, but in closing, like the church, we are the church, the b- body of believers worldwide, um, big C church is called to three things, to love God, to love others and to make disciples. And essentially everything that we've talked about when it comes to evangelism is fulfilling those three things. Loving God, putting him in your focus, putting your hope in him, loving others, displaying his gospel to the world around us, and making disciples, bringing people to Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Another just kind of practical note, like if you're if you're worried about um if you're worried about what you're gonna say when those opportunities arise, like let's say you know, God's given you somebody and you've been praying for them and, and now you're asking God for an opportunity, but you're worried about what you're going to say. I would say two things. Number one, scripture teaches, don't be worried about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you words to speak in the moment, right? But also don't, um, just because you're not worried about it doesn't mean you can't prepare, right? Mm. Grab a leader from your church, grab a mentor, grab somebody um, even a peer, somebody that you can just be like, okay, I want to, can you just be my listening ear as I talk about the message of the gospel and my testimony and, and let them give you some feedback, some criticism. Where could you be more clear? Where could you, you know, was there stuff in there that didn't need to be in there? Was there, you know, um, and those kinds of things and just, just start doing it in a place that's safe and and comfortable where you can get some feedback. It's, um, it's huge in helping you to feel more comfortable and also preparing you to, to speak in a way that's clear that people will understand. I don't think that's, um, I don't think that, that, that kind of practice is not trusting in, in God. God will give you specific words to speak in the moment. It's not an excuse for us to be unprepared. And then just some other po- previous podcast episodes, if you're just joining us for the first time. Um, some other ones that might be helpful for you are our previous podcast episodes on fellowship. Um, you know, what does that look like to be in fellowship with one another? Um, hospitality, this idea of inviting the stranger in. We've talked about that. Um, and then all the way at the very beginning of this season where we're talking about spiritual disciplines, Bible reading, Bible study, prayer, um, all of these things are all incorporated into evangelism, which is why we saved evangelism for now is we're building on top of each of these things. Um, So make sure if you're just joining us, you go back and check out some of those other episodes um, and let us know in the comments. Give us a thumbs up, a like, a share, a subscribe. Um, If this was helpful to you, um, it really helps more people hear the message of living fearless, of how these spiritual disciplines really help us to live a fearless life in Christ.